Good morning, everybody, and welcome to BDO's continuing IFRS advisory webinar series. Um, this is the eighth uh, uh, webinar of our 2018 series. Um, my name is Kevin Frobus. Um, as you can see on your screen, I'm Associate Director in the IFRS advisory team. And today I'll be uh, leading the discussion on IFRS 9 and problem areas. Um, for those of, our, of you who are regular attendees, um, this is uh, essentially a continuation of last month's webinar where we spoke about risk assessment in IFRS 9. Um, but I will obviously do a recap. So for those of you who are who, who, who missed last month's um, webinar, it, it won't seem completely all foreign to you. Um, just some logistics. If you have uh, problems with the connection, uh, maybe just type a question in the question box and we'll get our assistance to to help you with that. Um, I will take questions most likely at the end of the webinar if we have time left um, and as, as, as usual I, I'm always available for questions via email or telephone if you if you wish to talk to me um, outside of the webinar. So we've got an hour so I'll hop right into it um, and um, get going on the topic. Um, this is just a reminder slide of the webinars we've uh, presented in the past on this particular topic, which is I4S9. Um, I4S9 is, is financial instruments, the new financial instrument standard. And um, we, we've used the I4S abbreviation, but the equivalent in Australia is AASB9. Um, as I'd mentioned, this was a continuation, essentially, of the risk assessment session last month. Um, if you're looking for specific uh, topics on IFRS 9, we've dealt with transition in June classification and measurement in March of 2017, way back now, um, impairment in April of 2017, and hedging in December 2017. So you can go and find those webinars online um, on the BDO um, IFRS uh, webinar series page. They're all there uh, to download and watch. So hopping into this webinar, I'll do a quick recap of, of the topic. And then I'll hop into problem areas. The problem areas we'll be looking at today are, are really implementation issues that we are seeing with the standard. So it's, it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment or live topic. Um, the four that I've selected are four areas that keep coming up when it comes to queries from clients and 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 and, and also from our audit team who are who are currently dealing with a lot of clients who are who are, who are either adopting or about to adopt the standard, and, and obviously we're in, our, we're in our busy season at the moment for junior ends. Um, so we're seeing a number of issues crop up, and the four that I've chosen are the, are the, the, the key areas that, that I'm getting a number of questions on. So that's transitional preparedness, and I think it goes without saying that you need to be prepared for the new standards, and obviously that is becoming a problem area. Um, Interactions with other standards. This was one that I perhaps didn't see coming. I mean, I'll talk about that later. And then related party loans. Um, the related party loans was one that that obviously is included in the new standard, but I think that we tend to put a visor on when we're dealing with related parties, like subsidiary and parent loans. We, we think they're different to other types of financial assets and they tend to be overlooked. So I'll deal with those um, as well. And then impairment. The big one really is impairment. This is the new model for recognizing impairment of certain financial assets and it is proving to be challenging and problematic. All right, so a quick recap. Um, so the recap is, first of all, transition where we are. Now, um, um, we are already into um, this new standard. Um, we've passed the 1 July 2018 date of initial application, um, which is why we are seeing many of these um, questions. The mandatory application of IFRS 9 has, has, has since passed us. Um, for those in their December year end, um, they've had this for quite a while, but for the June year end, it, it, it's coming upon us. Um, there is an expectation that there'll be disclosures in the financial statements for the impact of this in the coming year. And that's where we are running into our issue with many clients because they are suddenly realized that they can't actually quantify or even talk to what the impact of these new standards are going to be. Um, so it's all about year and it's all, all current. The classifications, um, 
as you would remember from our previous webinars, um, the multitude of various types of classifications under the old standard are all gone, and they've really replaced it with a relatively simple model, which says um, you have to look at the type of cash flow and the business model, and if your financial instrument, um, on the financial asset side at least, is solely payments of principal interest, and if you hold it to collect the actual cash flows under a cash uh, a, a collect model business model you can recognize it at amortized cost but really everything else is at fair value or some type of variation of fair value after that um, these two slides i've just included as a quick recap business model is how you manage the collection of your financial assets it's a matter of fact so it's observable in the entity you can see how an entity does this it's not some type of pie in the sky or um, model that you hope to one day achieve it's what you actually do do you hold on to your financial assets to collect cash or are you selling them it's relatively relatively simple um, this the solely principle um, and interest or solely payments of principal interest test. This is the one that's proving a bit more problematic and challenging. So I'll deal with this one a little bit later on um, in the webinar. This one talks about the fact that a financial asset must be made up of solely of principal and interest, um, um, which deals with specific payments on specific dates over the life of the instrument in order for it to fall into a category to be measured at amortized cost. Um, now, there are lots of little rules that go with this. Um, things like the interest must comprise only compensation for credit risk, time value of money, and sometimes liquidity, profit margin, and admin costs. Really what you're looking for on the SPPI test is it must be a basic lending arrangement. Things like trade receivables, where it really is a basic lending arrangement, you're providing them a um, couple of 30 days or 60 days to repay um, their, their, their receivable. So there's your time value of money. You might put, put a bit of interest on that for credit risk, but it's a basic lending arrangement. I'm giving you credit. Anything that starts to introduce exposures to risks and volatilities that are unrelated to a basic lending arrangement, this is where you start to run into issues with the SPPI. And I think we've been hammering on this point for all the previous webinars. This one keeps coming up because it is the big change. There are a number of types of financial asset. Uh, balances and loans that won't qualify under the SPPI test to be recognized at amortized cost going forward. So that's where your change is coming. Um, and that's the area that's obviously proving a little bit problematic. On the impairment side, this is then the other big area where, where things have changed. The impairment of financial assets um, are, are, are broken into three stages, uh, stage one, two, and three. And really, the, the, the stage one is your performing type um, assets, where the um, counterparty has a strong capacity to meet. Um, and the stage one type impairment, you are still required under the general approach to now recognize what we call an expected credit loss. So 12-month expected credit losses must be recognized for those. Stage two and stage three is where you start to have a, a, a change in the credit risk, where the risks of default start to increase. And then you start to get underperforming and non-performing type loans, where you need to recognize full lifetime expected credit losses under those two, two models. This is proving problematic to a number of entities, mostly because it actually requires a bit of thought, it requires a bit of information gathering, decision making, and in some cases, modeling. Um, under the current accounting standards, just as a reminder, um, the current accounting standards talks about impairment of financial assets when there's objective evidence of impairment, which is more akin to the stage three. So it's obvious under this model that there will be earlier recognition of impairment allowances, because currently really, the standard really only current standard really only uh, requires impairment at the stage three so stage two and one is the new areas and of course how we measure the the number is is relatively new and you can see it in this one a simplified approach to trade receivables generally speaking um, under the under the good old days we would have had sort of like provisions um, on, on specific debtors or debtors that were maybe more than 90 days past due. This is just a, a, a very basic example of what it might look like for, for trade receivables under the new approach. And you can see there that we are actually recognizing credit loss allowances already for those receivables in current. 
you can see the first line current receivables in this example have a 0.5 expected default rate against it which means we have an allowance of 80,000 uh, currency units against it that's basically saying you've got a, prov a, a provisional one allowance against receivables right at the start already right at, right in stage one um, for receivable even if they haven't passed the current and they're not yet due that's really just the impact of that okay before we hop into it I'm going to run a quick poll um, to see if you were listening just let me get the technology all organized um, first poll is just to test whether you were listening a um, couple of easy questions has the poll launched so the questions are which of these uh, which of these are features of the new i4s9 select as many that, uh, that apply so we have hedge effectiveness means Offsets in the 80 to 120% range. The standard applies from 1 January 2019. Assets are recorded at fair value through profit and loss if they pass the SPPI test. And the new standard allows all equity instruments to be measured through other comprehensive income. So which of these are features of IFRS 9? Got a good um, number of attendees today, well over 160 and counting. Um, I think the vote is proving a little bit challenging. We've got about 40% of you have voted. Take your time, no rush. Which of those are features of the new IFRS 9? Hedge effectiveness means offsets in the 80 to 120% range. That's obviously for hedge accounting. The standard applies from 1 January 2019. Assets are recorded at fair value through profit and loss if they pass the SPPI test. And the standard allows all equity instruments measured through other comprehensive income. All right, so we're about halfway there. I encourage you to, to give it a go. We, normally we wait for about 60% of you to vote. So um, I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, I think we're mostly there. So I'm gonna close the, close the poll and share this on screen. So a good, a good, a good smattering um, of an attempt. Um, so let's deal with each of them individually. Um, hedge effectiveness means offsets in the 80 to 120% range. So that's actually not a feature of the new IFRS 9. It's a feature of the old SSB 139. Um, under the new standard, there's a little bit more um, flexibility in actually establishing the hedge um, offset range and the ratio. So that 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 that, that that's an old requirement. A bit a bit of inflexibility which has been taken away under the new standard the standard applies from 1 january 2019 was a bit of a trick one it actually applies from 20, 2018 it's already in effect so that was a a bit of a trick one there also isn't a feature of it was not it actually applies from the year before we're currently in it we're already there um, which is why the december year ends are already struggling with this um, assets are recorded at fair value through profit and loss if they pass the sppr test this one's a bit of a trick question. I didn't actually give you all the information. Um, it, it could be true if it fails the business model test, um, but of course, it, if assets are, um, if they pass the SPPI test and they're held to collect, then they'll actually be at amortized cost. So that one is true, but conditional on the business model being a held to collect and sell or a held to sell model. And then allows all equity instruments measured at, uh, through uh, the comprehensive income. That's not really true. Some equity instruments can be measured through other comprehensive income. The conditions being that it's an irrevocable position at initial recognition and it mustn't be held for trading um, for those types of equity instruments. So I hope you enjoyed that as a quick test. Um, thank you for all your participation. Um, lots of little tricks to get past there, which demonstrates the point, I think, that um, the standard does have some problem areas which we are struggling with and, and we need to, to, to work through. 
to recap the uh, one of the options there um, effective date this is the transitional preparedness that we're struggling with so the the standard is effective 1 January 2018 um, as you can see there the December year ends already already into this one um, and 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 they're, and they're getting ready for it um, the June junior ends have just entered into it and they're just finishing off their last year end under the old standard um, the common problem area that's arriving uh, arising from this which we didn't see coming or at least i didn't see it coming was just how much ASB 9 has been forgotten so a lot of entities are focused on the new revenue standard and the new lease standard and 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 that is there's justification for that especially on the revenue standard the revenue standard as I, as you could see in the previous slide is also effective from the same dates for for profit entities so let's put that back on the screen and it 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 has probably a much bigger impact on systems and 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 really the number that matters to most people which is revenue and profit it's a big focus for a number of entities but by focusing on ASB 15 and in some cases on the new leasing standard we we are tending to forget ASB 9 we think that there's no impact coming from it so it's kind of like the forgotten standard and what's actually happening is as we get to it we are suddenly getting to um, signing off financial statements or signing off half-year reports or or looking at the disclosures about the impact and we're suddenly realizing that things have been forgotten and not seen and we're not ready to go so in terms of the problem areas I'd actually just like to encourage you to not forget ASP 9 um, it isn't as simple as we think it is there are a number of types of assets that won't be accounted for the same way under the new standard um, hedging is complicated, but it's actually not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is instruments that are previously were at amortized cost, which are now at fair value. And if that's not the case, then they're going to have an impairment under the new expected credit loss model. And so, um, you know, data has to be gathered. And, and all these things take time and they take preparedness. I mean, it can't be done in, um, uh, in, in a short period of time. The other uh, common problem area that we've run, run into is for the listed companies or the half-year reporters um, and this is because the the standard just like the revenue standard doesn't get um, adjusted for or implemented at year end it actually gets adjusted for at date of initial application i'll put this slide back up again and i'll use the, um, the junior ends as an example so if you have a look at this slide and assume this is a listed company um, the date of initial application of this standard is 1 july 2018 for let's say junior end which means that if you're a half year producer when it comes to 30 December 2018 half year results you have to have adopted the new standard on the first day of the half year report you can't wait till the end of June 2019 to do your annual reports to then adopt the standard the standard gets adopted on 1 July 2018 so we, we are finding a couple of, of listed entities who are doing half years who are scurrying around with their half year results suddenly realizing that they're actually adopted a new standard on the first day of the of, of the year and they haven't necessarily adjusted for that and come half year results they now have a, a, a bit of a problem so that, that that's a problem area we have run into i think in many cases um, the, the purpose of today's webinar is probably not so much to get through a lot of the technical details it's actually to make the point that um, the problem area with the standard is actually just being prepared just having sure you've you've looked at the standard you've gathered the information you've made the judgments a lot of it falls into place if you're actually prepared if you're not prepared um, many of the technical aspects aren't going to make any uh, uh, any sense because you're just not going to have the information necessary to do the adjustments and to uh, and to adopt the changes. So that's really the biggest problem area we're focusing on. So there's a bit of a summary slide on transitional preparedness, sourcing data on which to base some of these estimates and judgments, like impairment assessments, uh, default rates, um, forward-thinking estimates on whether uh, default is going to happen all those things really does take time some of it requires building models calculations um, and that may even require you require you getting external um, uh, external help to do that some of the financial institutions um, or even just some of the smaller credit unions um, require models to be built for some of the impairment assessments and they don't necessarily have that skill themselves so they've got to go out and get that skill and then of course it's documenting qualitative assessments putting it on file making sure your auditors are happy all those things take time and I think the the the, the you know the, the comment of the day is being prepared and impeccable timing is two-thirds of the way there if you're not prepared 
and you don't get your timing right, sometimes it's just not going to happen by the time you need to issue your results. All right, so moving on then to interaction with other standards. Um, this is a problem area that's cropped up because we tend to also treat these standards in isolation. Um, so in adopting the new revenue standard and in adopting the new uh, AASB 9, um, we've realized that there's, that, that there's interactions with the other standards that can't be overlooked. One of the big interactions that I've run into, um, which uh, a number of entities perhaps didn't see coming, was the application of the amortized cost method. Now, this is in a scenario where you have loans, whether it be a financial liability or financial asset, um, where you're applying the amortized cost method. Um, so what that means is you're recording um, interest at the effective interest rate method. So you, you, you start with the loan um, at its trans transaction price at the beginning, you work out the effective interest rate, and then you unwind the interest over the life of the instrument at, a, at, 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 the, at, at its effective interest rate. Um, in the past, when there were modifications to those uh, instruments, in some scenarios, entities were actually re uh, adjusting the effective interest um, or re restating the effective interest rate um, based on whatever the modification was to the loan. And this often happened where you refinanced, let's say, a financial liability. You didn't de-recognize uh, de the liability, um, but because of the refinance, you adjusted the original, uh, the original effective interest rate. Then you have a new effective interest rate and you move forward on that. Under the new standard, AASB 9, some of those loopholes or some of those um, practices have been, have been curtailed. Um, and one of the key ones is that you cannot really change the effective interest rate from the origination of the instrument, which means if you've got a refinance um, of a loan and you don't recognize, uh, de-recognize the loan, but you continue um, to, to, to recognize the refinance loan uh, as an original instrument, you actually don't change the original effective interest rate. What this means is when you are transitioning from AASB 139 to AASB 9, you actually may have accounted for or applied the amortized cost method incorrectly under the old standard when compared to the new standard, which means that on transition to AASB 9, you actually have to go and do a retrospective adjustment. So even though you're applying the amortized cost method both under the old and the new standard, you might have found that you actually have a retrospective adjustment because the, the application of the amortized cost method under the old and the new standard is actually different. So that's something to think about. Just because you've got an, uh, a, an instrument that is un, an amortized cost method under both of the standards, the old and the new one, doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to have a retrospective adjustment on initial um, application of the new standard. So that's first interaction with the standard. It's probably a highly technical um, slide, but really the key message is that is don't assume just because you're under amortized cost and you're not going to have a change under the old or the new standard, you've actually got the number right. It may actually require a retrospective adjustment just to um, effectively account for the amortized cost method correctly under the new standard if you haven't applied that method correctly from the old standard. So that's the first interaction that we're having problems with. The second interaction is this. Under the new standard, a number of assets which previously were financial assets under the old financial instrument standard will now be contract assets under the revenue standard. This is something we ran into, for example, with mortgage brokers. Mortgage brokers generally have a trail, trail asset that they earn because they originate a mortgage for the bank and they earn a trail over the life of the life of the of the mortgage or the loan. Um, but in that scenario, the trail asset isn't a financial asset under the new financial instrument standard. It's actually a contract asset under the revenue standard. Why? Because the financial asset only arises when you have an unconditional right to receive that. In, in, in regards of trail asset, for example, they actually have to wait for the loan to still be in existence every month. In other words, the loan must still exist and still be valid for them to earn the trail each month. So as a result, um, under the new revenue standard, you end up, end up with a contract asset until such time as each month elapses, where that month's trail is received. In that case, then it becomes a financial instrument. So this interaction is another complication we're running into, where AASB 9 in isolation cannot be adopted without considering the other standards that go with it. So some financial assets 
under the old 139 will become contract assets under the new WASB 15, and they won't be financial assets under the, under the new WASB 9. All this complication tells me, once again, that you need to start early before adopting these standards, because it's not as simple as saying I had a loan last time and therefore I have a loan this time. There are actually a whole bunch of interactions that need to be considered. And likewise with things like lease receivables um, and once again, contract assets. Contract assets and lease receivables very much come from other accounting standards, being the lease standard and the revenue standard, but they need to be considered for impairment under the new WASB 9. In other words, the new expected credit loss model with stages one, two, and three applies equally to contract assets and lease receivables, just like other financial assets. All right, I'm almost out of breath from those um, first two problem areas. Um, I mean, the message of those is, after being very technical, is there are some interactions with other standards that can't be ignored. Just because you're under amortized costs from the last standard to the new standard doesn't mean um, you've actually applied it right in the past, and that means you're not going to have a retrospective adjustment. Um, and start early. Some of the stuff really does take time. Don't be caught out by by a couple of days to go before you want to issue your financials and you suddenly realize you haven't actually addressed the standard. All right, I'm going to move on to related party loans. Um, the reason why I've put this up is um, it's almost like the ugly system, the ugly duckling when it comes to financial instruments, because when we have loans with related parties like parent and subsidiary loans, we tend to treat them differently. We tend to record them at cost and kind of just leave them there and hopefully they just no one notices that they're just like every other financial instrument needs to be categorized and impaired. Um, BDO has actually released a guide called Applying IFRS 9 to Related Company Loans. And this is available on our website. It's under the IFRS in practice section of the BDO website, bdo.com.au. Download for free. Um, and, and this guide's comprehensive guide to IFRS 9 applied to related company loans. But it's actually a good guide if you want to see how the standard applies really to any loan, because the concepts are really the same, whether it's a related party loan or not. You know, the same context, expected credit losses, classifying as amortized cost or fair value, all those things have to be considered and are addressed in this guide. So I encourage you to go and download that. I'm actually going to use examples out of that guide for the remainder of the session because then you can easily go and look those examples up in the guide and follow the logic if you miss something from the webinar. First thing is um, the scope. The guide makes it very clear that IFRS 9 applies to long-term interest in associates or joint ventures to which the equity method is not applied and interest in subsidiaries that do not give access to returns that are associated with ownership interest. In plain English, what that's saying is, if you have long-term loans with joint ventures, associates, and subsidiaries, you cannot deny the fact that often they're actually fall into IFRS 9. Um, it's really just a, a, a technical way of saying, don't, don't treat them differently if they fall into the loan under uh, as a financial instrument to any other loan with a third party. They still need to be considered for classification and impairment in some cases. Bringing up the classification slide, it means that if you have a loan, and, and, and I'm going to assume, a, let's say, a loan receivable or a loan asset from a parent to a subsidiary, it still needs to be considered under all the same rules. Does it comprise solely payments of principal and interest? Is it in a business model held to collect? That would make it amortized cost. Otherwise, it needs to be recorded at fair value in some form or another. Now, I'm going to do three examples um, uh, for, for this webinar. And the reason why I'm going to focus on these is because they, they, they demonstrate the application of the solely principle and interest concept. Just hopping back to that slide, I'm not going to deal with the business model because most loans with related parties are held to collect. I, I, I can't recall the last time I saw uh, an entity that has a loan with a related party that it was then selling. So generally speaking, loans with related party or, 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 or financial instruments with, with um, uh, related parties aren't held to sell. So I'm, I'm, I'm very definitely in the first column, they hold to collect. So the big problem with IFRS 9 and loans with related parties is whether they meet the solely principal um, and interest test, the SPPI test. So the three I'm going to look at is interest-free loans, uh, prepayment and demand option loans, and asset performance loans. 
these three are dealt with in the guide that I've pointed out. Um, and I'll put the first one up, up on the screen. I'll do this one with you. So the first example is, you've got a parent who obtains external bank financing at competitive market rates and then lends it to its subsidiaries on an interest-free basis. This is common where you know the parent entity has the relationship with the bank, the treasury type function, and it lends money to its subsidiaries on an interest-free basis. So on 1 January 2018, parent A advanced a loan of a million dollars or a million currency units to its subsidiary B with the following terms, 0% interest and repayable in three years in December 2020. So the purpose of the loan is to fund subsidiary B's ongoing business operations. Based on current cash flow projections, subsidiary B is expected to be in a position to fund the repayment and assume that the market rate of interest for a similar loan is 15%. The loan is also not considered to be pokey. Now, I'm not gonna deal with pokey today, but what that really means, it's uh, purchased and originated credit impaired. Um, I'm not dealing with that in um, this webinar, but it is dealt with um, comprehensively in the guide I'm referring to. Um, and, it, and, and it is something that you might need to consider with your related party loans. Um, but for purposes of simplicity and moving the webinar along, I will ignore um, purchased and originated credit impaired loans. And the example also assumes that it isn't one of those. So the question here is, does the loan meet the SPPI test? And just for fun, I'm gonna run another, another poll to see what you think. And I'll take a breather and you can think about that one. While that poll is running, I do have a question which I'll knock off um, in the background. The question that has come through asks if the application of AASP9 is mainly impacting on listed companies. The answer is no, it's actually impacting on, on all entities that apply AASP. Um, every entity that applies AASP is being impacted by AASP9. Um, and in some cases, the the problems or the problem areas are harder for the unlisted because they generally have um, unsophisticated type accounting systems. So it becomes harder for them to actually apply some of these concepts without having to build new models or to, to create new systems. So hope that answers that question. All right, so back to the poll. Does the loan meet the SPPI test? Right, I'm gonna close the poll and share with you the results. And don't you just love it? Virtually 50% yes and 50% no. Which I didn't see coming. Sorry, let me just make sure the technology, am I still showing the results? I am still showing the results. So let me just hide that. Thank you for your, your vote. Um, and I'll return back to that example. Now, in this one, I will discuss with you the way that you'd go about this um, uh, to, to do the assessment and then, and then reach a conclusion. Um, so in order to meet the SPPI test, as we've discussed, um, the contractual cash flows, in this case, the million dollars, in three years must represent payments of principal and interest. The principal um, being the initial fair value of the loan and the interest being some type of effective interest rate um, uh, method where we recover um, uh, recover an amount that's really compensation for credit risk and time value of money. In the case of a long-term um, interest-free loan, um, what generally happens in the scenario is that the fair value on initial recognition is the million dollars discounted back over three years using a market rate. In this case, the market rate is 15%. So you do that calculation, you're gonna to get to roughly $650,000 um, as the initial fair value of the loan. That then becomes the, the starting principal amount. 
And if the repayment in three years time is a million dollars, then it is obvious or it is clear that you have been compensated for principal and interest, the principal being the original $650,000 and that and the interest being the 15% effective interest rate which unwinds over the three years. So in this case, I'm relatively comfortable concluding that it meets the SPPI test. So for those of you who went with, yes, it meets the SPPI test, I'm happy with that, with, with that outcome. Um, it isn't different to current accounting by many entities. Many entities would do the same under the current standards, which is correct, but getting to that answer requires a different way of thinking. The way of thinking under this standard is one, is it solely principal and interest? And two, is it in a business model to collect the cash flows, which hopefully in this case it is. So the accounting might not look different under the new standard, but the logic behind it is obviously different. Move to the next one, change it ever so slightly. This one is parent A provides a loan of 5 million to subsidiary C to fund its ongoing business operations. The loan has the following terms, 0% interest and 5 million repayable on demand um, of parent A. Assume that parent A does not intend demand repayment for the loan for several years. And once again, the loan is not pokey, which um, we've discussed, we're gonna ignore. So the question is, does the loan meet the SPPI test? Now I'm not gonna ask you to do a poll on this one. I'll just discuss the answer with you, just to demonstrate the way you should approach this in your thinking. So in this case, we don't have any interest and we have a 5 million on demand. Now demand and prepayment options are dealt with extensively in the new standard and the literature because it's very common um, in related party type loans as well, as well as third party loans. The question you've got to go back to once again is, do the contractual cash flows, the 5 million, which is repayable on demand, represent payments of principal, being the fair value of initial recognition and interest. Now. Although there's 0% interest there, don't be um, alarmed by the fact that, that there might be some type of compensation here, which actually does embed interest. So the first thing is to say is, well, what's the principal amount? And the principal amount is the fair value at initial recognition. And in this case, it's the face value, the transaction price at the start. Because um, A can demand repayment of the 5 million, effectively the very next day, that is the fair value or the principal. The interest in that case is 0% because the demand repayment is the 5 million principal and the interest is zero. It may ha There may be no interest, but it is still payment of capital or payment of principal and interest. And it does therefore meet the SPPI test. A little bit different and a little bit weird, but you do get to the same answer thinking the same way establish the principal amount, which is the fair value at initial recognition, and then consider what the contractual cash flows are and whether those contractual cash flows are compensation for principal and interest. And in this case, they are because the demand feature means that at any point, it can be clawed back being principal and interest, even though the interest is zero in this example. A little bit more complicated, the same outcome probably as many entities are currently accounting for it, but how do you get to whether it's an amortized cost loan? The logic is different. And that's the problem area in FRS 9 is to, to get to justify how you get to your current accounting using the new principles. Example C, which I'm gonna throw onto the screen now, will demonstrate how this can change the current practice. Parent A provides a loan of $3 million to its subsidiary, a real, real estate investment company. Subsidiary D will use the loan to part fund a property and intends to generate cash flows from rental income. And the loan has the following terms. There's a 3 million repayment in three years time, 5% annual interest, and a 30% of the annual appreciation in the property value will, be, will also be paid in three years time. Don't need to run a poll and I don't think it takes a lot of time for you to consider that this will not meet the SPPI test. And the reason why is because there's another risk that's been um, put in here or there's compensation for something else that's lurking. The annual appreciation of property value that results in a 30% payment is property risk. Um, the entity has been compensated for something more than just um, credit risk and time value of money. Um, they be, they're, they're effectively participating in, 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 in the change of property value underlying, underlying the property. They are 
they, they are party to the to, to the to, to the changes in property value and property risk. That risk factor has changed the nature of the cash flows. It's no longer a basic lending arrangement, so it doesn't meet the SPPI test, which means under the new standard it will be at fair value. This will be a change from the current accounting standard. So even though the first two examples resulted in relatively the same accounting as you used to for a related party type loan, this is an example that demonstrates that using the same principles, what's the principle, what's the interest, is there other exposures and risks that are embedded in there, and you can suddenly have something that's different under the new standard. All right, hopefully we are doing okay. I might actually just check if there's another question lurking. I don't think there is, is there? Um, I can't read it for some reason. So we've got a question, can you please run through the journal entries for the 1 million interest-free loan on day one? I'll go one better. The next example I do under the impairment actually does that for us. So you'll see it's a different example, but the same journal. So I will I will defer that one and come back to it. Um, I actually can't I actually can't read the second question, so I might come back to that at the end. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm working off a small screen and. Um, the questions are cutting themselves off. I'll just park the questions at the back and try and come to them at the end. I'm wondering if you can probably just um, write them down on a piece of paper, um, talking to my assistant, um, and I'll, I'll try and come back to them at the end. All right, so running through to the impairment. The reason why I spent so much time on related party loans and whether it's at amortized cost and at fair value is because the classification of the financial asset at amortized cost or fair value drives in many ways the impairment. If you have a loan at amortized cost, it will be subject to the new impairment requirements. That is true for amortized costs and those debt instruments that are at fair value through other comprehensive income. If a loan is a fair value through profit and loss, instrument, then the impairment expected credit loss model doesn't apply to it. So getting the classification right at the start, um, it's kind of a double-edged sword because if you get to record the asset at amortized cost because it meets the SPPI test and it's held to collect, in many ways the accounting is more simple because you get to just unwind the instrument or measure it at an effective interest rate, but then you do need to run an impairment model against it. Whereas under the fair value to profit and loss, you don't need to do the impairment model, but of course then you need to determine the fair value. So both of them really have, have a lot of work behind it. So, so the classification is ultra important because it then determines really, uh, not only the measurement, but then also whether the impairment model applies. So the impairment model looks like this, which we put on the screen a couple of times. Got stage one, stage two, stage three. And the general approach is you've, got to decide at each reporting date which, 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 which stage you are in based on a credit risk assessment. And then once you've decided on which stage you're in, you then measure whether you have expected credit losses and recognize them at, in, in full at stage two or three, or 12 month expected credit losses in stage one. Now, <clears throat> impairment um, is the difference between the present value of expected and contractual cash flows, whereas ex, uh, expected credit loss is the weighted average of credit losses using a risk of default. At this point, I, I lose myself even sometimes because it sounds very much like statistical modeling and it's really hard work. Um, and, 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 and the standard talks about gathering information that's reasonable and supportable without, due un, uh, without undue cost or effort. So what does this all mean? This is the problem area in the IFRS 9. Um, first problem is what does reasonable and supportable information mean? So it means generally historical information, which might be your starting point, which is then adjusted for current conditions and future forecasts. But it also means that you shouldn't be spending an enormous amount of time and effort on it, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't spend any time and cost and effort. You've got to give it a shot. The types of information the standard wants you to gather is borrower-specific information, 
so information about key performance indicators, liquidity, profitability, and gearing. Now, in the case of a related party, for example, you'll know a lot of that information because let's say you're the parent, well, your subsidiary, you, you, you'll have access to that type of information. You'll be able to estimate future cash flows. You'll be able to know information about collateral and uh, the underlying value of the business. But it also has to be considered in the context of the uh, economic and business environment. What does unemployment look like? Government changes. I wrote government changes there because of what's happening this week in Australia. I'm sure business confidence has gone for a loop, so it might be something you want to take into account. Commodity prices, competitor environment, all these things have to be taken into. It's all very nice um, to have all this. It's all, all very theoretical and in the standard. The problem area, of course, is applying it in practice. So what I decided to do for the remaining part of this webinar was to take an example out of the guide on related party, um, related a related party IFRS 9 application, and just show you the type of thinking that is required in applying the impairment model to a related party type balance. This is this is this example applies the entity's own experiences, um, experience of other entities. It looks at industry reports and economic data, and it makes the decisions it needs to make to try and get to the impairment amount to recognize on a loan with a related party. By the way, I've put a web um, address on screen, which is a very good website that you might want to use to find this forward-looking information that might help you in your assessment. There's lots of information, um, and it's something that I've started to use a lot of in, 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 in working with these types of assessments. So let's have a look then at this example. Now, if you don't keep up with everything I'm going to say, or you don't follow everything that I'm saying, that's fine because the example is straight out of the guide that I've put a picture up on the website. So you can go pick the guide up and you can go work through the example yourself. Um, and, 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 and if anything, the message of this example is to demonstrate the problem behind the new standard, which, which, which is the amount of time and effort and data and estimation and judgment that is required in preparing an impairment assessment. Um, so the lesson is don't leave it too late and start early. Um, so this is an expectation setting example. Don't try and follow it to try and understand everything that, that, that all the calculations on the screen. Just absorb the complexity on dealing with one related company loan, which has qualified for amortized cost measurement under the new standard. Right, so the example is, we have a parent, it's operates in the UK retail sector, and it has a subsidiary in region Y. To date, subsidiary B in region Y is performing well, is currently embarking on an investment plan to refurbish its retail premises and further develop its online offering, bit of a mouthful. Um, and parent A lends to subsidiary B, 10 million pounds, repayable in three years on an interest-free basis. So this is exa this example is virtually the same as the first one I put up, which 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 was is it classified at amortized cost or uh, do, does it meet the SPPI test? Um, and as one of our, one of our attendees asked, can I show you the journals um, at the start, which I will do right now? Um, I'll show you what those journals look like. Um, a bit of other information here. Um, is that subsidiary B also has a loan of one million pounds from Bank X, which has taken out several years ago. It's due for repayment in 2020, and that loan bears a market rate of interest and is senior to the loan from parent A. So in summary, we got a three-year loan from the parent, interest-free, where the market rate of interest is 15%, um, and um, the subsidiary has another loan, a senior loan, that it still has to pay back to the bank also in 2020. It's quite important. This will be the journal entry at the start. So what we'll do is we've got a 10 million pound loan. We will we will discount that back to uh, over three years to present day fair value, which is the gross carrying amount of the loan. So 6.575 um, or 6 million 575 pounds. The difference in this scenario is a investment in the subsidiary. Now, there's some contention around that, depending on what country you're in and depending on the terms of the arrangement. But really what you're actually doing is 
by giving an interest-free loan to your subsidiary, you're actually making an additional contribution into your subsidiary. That's how this example sees that. We can probably debate that one, um, and there might be different practices on that, but that is essentially what, what you're doing, is the, 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 the related party nature of it and the interest-free nature of it means that you're actually providing um, a, a, an equity contribution to your subsidiary. So that's the journal entry on, on, on day one. What will happen after this is at each reporting date over the three years, the 6.575 uh, million will build up back to the 10 million at an effective interest rate of 15%. So for example, at the end of year two, uh, sorry, at the end of year one, or the first reporting date after this loan, it will have built up to 7.561 million, 7.561 million, and so forth, until such time as you, you reach year three, in which case it'll be repaid. It does meet the amortized cost method because, as we discovered, it's solely principal and, and interest, um, because the the, the contractual uh, payment in year three will compensate the parent for the principal being the 6.5 and the interest over the three years. Um, so it will meet the amortized cost method. Because it's amortized cost, it then has to be subject to the new expected credit loss impairment model. So in order to do the impairment, a couple of steps. First step is the entity should have an initial credit risk assessment. The entity needs to know what the risk, risk uh, the credit risk of its subsidiary is in order so that it can decide later on whether it's in stage one, two, and three um, of the impairment model. All right, how does it do this? Well, it looks at past, current, and expected operating performance of the subsidiary. And um, it's got to look at things like the key business risks, so general economic environment you know, where, where the subsidiary operates, things like unemployment, consumer confidence and inflation, but also the current cash flow projections. So things like the ability to fully repay not only the loan to the parent in three years time, but the ability to repay the bank loan to the bank in 2020. Remember that the subsidiary had a bank loan that was senior to the parent loan. So all these things will be, be looked at and an initial assessment of credit risk will be performed. <clears throat> okay. Before you can move on to the reporting date, um, impairment calculations or assessment, it is important that the entity establish a couple of definitions. Every entity will have different definitions of what default means and how it's going to do its credit risk assessment. So I've put this on the screen because this is the first salvo of the type of um, documentation and assessment that every entity will have to do in applying the impairment model to this type alone. The first thing that's going to be really important is to define what default means. Now, lots of words on the screen, um, but this is an, ex and I've taken this straight out of the guide, it's, it's really just a picture paste, but it demonstrates not only the type of thinking that's required, but the type of documentation that an entity should start getting ready to perform so that it can document its assessment, so that the auditors will be able to look at it, and that it can apply these things consistently to, to, to the assessment year on year. Now, in this case, um, if you read all that detail, I'll just point out the, the important bits. Uh, the entity has defined, uh, default really has been um, when a minimum threshold of solvency ratio is breached. So the last sentence in the definition of default section says, parent A sets a minimum threshold for what is considered to be the key solvency ratio. And in the event that that threshold is breached, a default is assumed to have occurred. It's important to define what default means because in applying the impairment model, you need to first of all know what default means so that you can assess the risk of that default so that you can start to factor those into numbers which can feed into an expected credit loss calculation as I'll demonstrate in the coming slides. The other thing that needs to be defined or, or, or documented is how they will actually do their credit risk assessment. Every reporting period um, end, the entity will have to decide whether the loan has credit risk that has um, changed to such a degree that the loan moves from one stage to the next. So stage one, two, or three. So in this case, the way they're gonna do it is they're gonna do what is called a qualitative assessment. Now, the reason I put this one up on the screen is this is probably going to be the approach that a lot of entities will take. Because assessing credit risk and um, whether there's been a significant increase in credit risk, which is what SICR stands for, um, most entities won't have statistical modeling. 
so which would, banks would probably have statistical mod, mod, modeling um, whereas most entities are unsophisticated so the entity will actually have to do a qualitative assessment of has the credit risk increased significantly enough for the loan to have moved from stage one to stage two or from stage two to stage three this is a process and in this case the way they're going to do it is they will once again look at things like liquidity and cash flow covering um, and they will look at that, that solvency ratio. So right to the bottom of the SICR assessment, parent A will look at whether there's been a significant increase in credit risk by looking at key solvency ratios and whether it falls below a particular limit. Notice they're not assessing whether the loan has defaulted. Default has been defined as a solvency ratio being breached. An increase in credit risk has been defined as when a a, a level of that solvency ratio has been achieved. So what's happened here is really the entity has documented its approach. They know what default is going to look like and they know what um, uh, movements in the solvency ratio will will, will, um, will will indicate when there's been a significant increase in credit risk. They will then use that approach at each reporting day to determine whether the loan is in stage one, two or three. And then once they know what stage they're in, they will then be able to estimate risks of default and measure the allowance under the expected credit loss method. So at the reporting period, 31 December 2018, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, pieces of information. Do you have a problem? All right, um, at the reporting period date, Parent A notes a couple of things, that economic conditions in the UK and region Y have become increasingly, un increasingly uncertain due to Brexit. One of the largest employers in region Y have closed down. Subsidiary B hasn't yet defaulted on any of its loan payments. So subsidiary B is still going, but the economic conditions around entity uh, subsidiary B are starting to change. Subsidiary B, B's KPIs have been considerably lower than its forecasts. Um, but we still expected to have sufficient funds to repay the loan in 2020, both to the parent and to the bank. Now, the solvency ratio has not been breached. In other words, it hasn't defaulted, but clearly the conditions around the subsidiary are changing. Things have started to move. So, first step at each reporting date is to decide which stage the loan is in, stage one, two, or three. In other words, what has to happen is the entity must now apply its method of determining whether there has been a significant increase in credit risk by looking at things like solvency ratios and macroeconomic indicators and deciding whether the loan is still in stage one, stage two, or stage three. Now, we've got about three minutes to go. I am going to go over. Hopefully, you are all okay with that. And there is one more poll to run, and I'm going to run it, which is in your opinion, based on the enormous volume of data I've given you, what stage of the impairment uh, is the loan in? In other words, which of these stages are we in? Stage one, two, or three at the reporting date? Wow, everybody's really on it and of going, uh, going, uh, voting really quickly. So that's very encouraging. I'm glad to see the interaction. Um, I'm glad you're all participating. There is a clear leader emerging, but I will not reveal that until we've got at least 50 or 60% of the vote. So I encourage you to vote as quick as possible. Just for those of you who did ask questions earlier, I have now received them in writing. I couldn't see them on the screen and I'll deal with them at the end of the webinar. Um, I will now close the poll. We've, we, we, we've only got about 45% or 45% of the votes, but that's fine. I think we have a clear winner. 
So closing, closing that, and thank you for your participation. We'll just share the results with you. And there's a clear winner that stage two is where the loan is. Now that is the stage that the guide concludes. And that's obviously, um, I think that it probably is more appropriate. In this scenario, the loan has not defaulted. It's a, I don't think stage three uh, is right because um, the subsidiary is still paying, is still expected to actually um, meet its cash flow obligations to both the bank loan as well as the parent loan. But obviously with forward looking information and the current state of play in the region, things have started to change. Um, and stage two probably is the more appropriate one there because based on entity A's own approach to, to, to assessing whether there's been a significant increase in credit risk based on solvency ratios, um, it, it probably will conclude that stage two has, 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 has been achieved. So stage two in the scenario is um, lifetime expected credit losses should be recognized in full. So I'm happy with that answer and I agree with the 63% of you who voted for stage two, as does the example in the guide. So let's return back to our example. We can now see where we are in the process. We've recognized the loan initially. We've set our policies on what default means. We set our policy on how we, significant, uh, how we uh, evaluate significant increases in credit risk. At the reporting date, we have now determined that stage two is where we are because we've assessed a significant increase in credit risk. The last two steps are actually to put numbers to the equation. First thing is to estimate the lifetime risk of default. That'll be followed by actually putting a number to the expected credit losses um, for purposes of recognition. Now, lots more information on the screen. Um, if, if, if ever there was a presentation of death by information, this is it. Um, but hopefully the message is coming through that there's a lot of work to do here and a lot of thinking to be applied. So parent A has to first go and define or, or work out what it mean, what it thinks the risks of default are going to be. Now the risk of default in this case is we're hoping to actually get to a number. The number is what's important here. Um, what is the risk of default? I'm not going to go through everything on the screen. Um, you can do that in your own time. And like I said, it is in the guide. So you don't have to have the slides to do this. In fact, the guide probably is a better place because it has all the writing and all the, all the bits and pieces that need to be considered um, in this regard. But I'll run through um, the type of thinking that parent A went through. First of all, parent A would have looked at internal information. And it is obvious that subsidiary B has never defaulted. That is important. It's never defaulted. Um, and it probably doesn't have information for default rates. So when you're looking at default rates and risks of default, starting with historical information is a good place. That can work, for example, with trade receivables where you can look at your previous bad debts and you'll be able to work out, well, what's my percentage of default on, 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 on my receivables? How many de debtors have defaulted in the past and what does that represent the risk of default? But in this case, subsidiary B has never defaulted um, on anything. And so kind of starting with the internal information of subsidiary B and its default history, um, it's probably not going to yield any any type of valuable information. So then entity A will then move to, let's say, external information. Um, the guide uses an example of um, going out into the market and looking for similar types of loans, but those, that type of information is really hard to come by, especially, for example, with listed entities. You won't always see that information in a listed set of financials for a comparable entity because subsidiary loans will probably be you know, consolidate and eliminate it out. Um, so in this, this case, Entity B would have to make an enormous amount of judgment and estimation. Um, there's a key number of in pieces of information um, in uh, the information that's on, this, on the screen, but the big one is right in the middle of the screen, it talks about um, the, the Entity A uh, assesses the risk of default from subsidiary B to be considerably higher than let's say a normal third party loan. Um, in this case, because there's actually higher ge gearing because there's a senior loan to the bank, which is followed by a loan to the parent and they both c come due in 2020. So um, the, the, the example in the guide makes the point that in many ways, the assessment that Entity A has to do at this point is very specific to this loan, 
doesn't necessarily rely on internal information because the subsidiary B has never defaulted and a lot of the external information actually just doesn't exist. So they reached the conclusion in this result that they actually have to go out to an external expert who, who uh, would actually work out this type of default rate based on liquidity and solvency ratios. Um, it's effectively an evaluation type exercise and they've uh, 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 arrived at the concept that um, there would be a 13.5%, uh, I think it was, that they've reached to um, risk of default. Um, yeah, 13.5%. That number is incredibly subjective and would need an enormous amount of backing up. It would, it, it would actually take time. It may involve external parties. It may involve you putting calculations together to try and justify it because this type of loan, especially with a related party, means comparable information um, and historical information just may not be available. It then moves on, takes that information, and it must now at least consider the possibility of a credit loss occurring. Um, and this is where economic scenario building starts to happen. And really, in this case, we've moved to three types of scenarios, a, a base case scenario one, two, and a worst case scenario three, where there actually is a default. Um, now, there are a number of calculations that go behind this, which I'm not going to get into right now. But in this case, after this entire set of calculations, what's actually happening is a final conclusion is really reached that the risk of default over the lifetime of the loan is 25%. That number then becomes your risk of default. You can see already that at this point, we are we, 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 we've done so much work behind this. And the question really has to become, how do you justify that? The way you justify that is sources of information, using information off the market, using historical internal information, consulting with external advisors and so forth, and bringing that number to a head. It can't just be a number that's plucked out of there. What are you actually looking for there? The risk of default. In other words, the risk of the solvency ratios being breached by subsidiary where is going to default according to your own definition of what default means. That's what that 25% um, uh, uh, means. And it's not just a number you're going to pluck out of the air. It's something that really has to be based on some type of estimation and judgment. That number can then feed into your measurement of your expected credit loss for lifetime credit losses. Now, these tables that I'm going to have on the screen now are complicated. I will take you very briefly through what they're trying to achieve, but it's once again scenario building. The scenario building here is you now have to actually do a weighted average calculation of the probable outcomes that will happen um, if there is expected credit losses or, or, or defaults and so forth. And in this case, they've built four scenarios with various percentages of likelihoods. And you can see here that if this is going to happen and expected credit loss is going to be achieved, what are the cash flows that are going to be recovered? Scenario one, for example, has that we'll have um, cash flows up to 5.6 million over time. Scenario two, eight, up to 8.3 and so forth. What's really happening here is the parent in a related party uh, is unlikely to shut the entity down. They're most likely going to wait. They're going to wait for the, for the, for, for, for the money. Most parents um, will actually extend the terms of the loan in order to recover something. They're not just going to call the loan in 2020. They'll let the bank be paid their money in 2020, and then they'll probably wait a number of years for the entity to recover in order to recover their own loan. So in this case, the scenarios that the entity has built are the four scenarios where they actually look at the cash flow forecasts, look at how entity of the subsidiary is going to be, look at the cash flows about paying the bank off in 2020, and then how long will we have to wait to get our money back? And the scenarios that they're actually that they've actually built are, are then weighted according to a likelihood factor. How likely do we think scenario one is of happening? How likely do we think scenario two is likely of happening? How long do we think scenario three is likely to happen? Notice in scenario three, scenario three actually does recover the full 10 million. But because it had to wait three or four extra years to do that, it has incurred credit losses. The credit losses in that scenario are the credit losses of time. Because they wait, they, they, they deferred the loan over, uh, over an extra couple of years, it actually meant that they incurred credit losses purely because they got the, the time value of money means that they just get less, less back over, over a present valuing approach. So 
these are expected um, cash flow scenarios, which then get discounted at the original effective interest rate of 15%. So the same scenarios with their likelihood factor, you can see here that they actually get um, discounted back the original effective interest rate and then they get compared to the present value of the contractual cash flows. That 7.561 is the current carrying amount of the loan that has been built up uh, to the first reporting date after it was originated. It is compared to the four scenarios where we've done a present value at the original effective interest rate to work out what the credit loss would be suffered under the, under the four scenarios. You can see that that scenario four has a 5.9 million credit loss suffered. Scenario three, where we wait for the 10 million all the way to the end, we have a credit loss of 1.26. That credit loss isn't a loss of money, that's a credit loss of time value of money. Those are the four scenarios that have been built up. That then moves along to awaiting. You need to weight those credit losses using their um, likelihood as a, as a weight. To get to a weighted average 2.268 million, that's the expected credit loss over the lifetime of the loan. That is then followed by the allowance that is recorded. Because we're in stage two, taking our risk of default of 25% and multiplying that by the weighted average lifetime credit losses over the life of the loan, we get a 567,000 uh, pound allowance. And that's the allowance that's recorded against the loan in stage two at the end of the first reporting season. Just like I did in the webinar last, last month, um, the intention of this example was to show you that even on a simple loan, there's a lot of work to do. Where do you get this data from? How do you estimate your judgments? How do you build your model and your calculations? How do you document your assessments? Um, and more importantly, are you prepared for it? That is the key to the problem area in IFRS 9. The expected credit loss model on impairment of assets at amortized cost, even those with related parties, is a significant change to what we're used to. There's a lot of work behind it. It requires a lot of pre preparation to be done. Um, and I, I encourage you on a, uh, to, to get ready for it if you haven't already started. Sure. Who's exhausted? I am. <laughs> Everybody happy? I'm not sure you are. Let's see if there's any more questions. Oh, sorry, I've actually I've uh, taken the, the presentation down. That is the end of the webinar. Um, as we always do, we, we say if you need assistance, you know, we, we, we've got all these webinars saved online. Um, next month, we will be working towards our leases standard. So we'll be moving away from financial instruments. 19th of September is our transition to IFRS 16, which is the transition to the new leasing standard. I've put my pretty picture up there, along with my colleagues in Melbourne, Perth, and Brisbane, Clark Wayne and Aletta, who are more than willing to take questions um, um, if you have, or reach out to them for any advice. Uh, and also the pretty pictures of our broader IFRS advisory team around the country. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to step back and answer those couple of questions that were that were outstanding. For those of you who want to hang on for them, there were two that I have in front of me. Um, I, the question, the first question was, how do you value example B in the second year? Value in the second year of example B. All right. Just to run you back to this one, this was right at the start. I used an example of an entity that provided a loan of 5 million where there was no interest and it was repayable on demand. I think the, the, the question is asking, well, how do you value the, um, the loan in, um, in the second year and third year and so forth? Well, in, in that scenario, it was a loan repayable on demand at parent A's insistence with 0% effective interest rate. So the loan is at face value for each year until it's until its demand is repaid. So it, 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 because it's at amortized cost, it doesn't get fair valued, but it is recorded at its face value in inverted commas, because its face value represents the demand feature of the principal and interest that can be recovered on demand. Hopefully that answers that question. And then there was another question which said, um, and this also goes back to the original questions, would the investments in the subsidiaries be treated at amortized costs? Um, 
the investment in subsidiaries, and I'm assuming you mean not the loan, the actual equity investments, wouldn't be treated under IFRS 9. They are treated by the standards on um, uh, investments in subsidiaries, associates, and joint ventures. Um, so they're actually, the investments in subsidiaries are, 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 are scoped out to another standard and are accounted for in accordance with those standards. Um, so no, it wouldn't be treated at amortized cost, but if it was treated as, an, as, a, as, a, as a financial instrument, under AA uh, IFRS 9, which it can be under certain scenarios, depending on the choices made by the entity in its accounting policies, um, an equity investment in a subsidiary would, would, as an equity instrument, wouldn't be at amortized cost because it doesn't represent solely principles and interests, so it would be at fair value. Um, and because it's an equity instrument, you would be able to make irrevocable decisions to record those through other comprehensive incomes. But investments in subsidiaries would really be eliminated on consolidation in the main set of financials in any event. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, and then a final question is, what's the most efficient way to implement the changes? I think the answer is to start early. That's probably the easiest answer to that question. Um, I think that, yeah, that look, it's to start early. And I think that's the message in the webinar is start early. The most efficient way is to start early. Get some help if you need it. Um, the, other, the other thing is to actually appoint a team. Um, a number of the entities that have come to us who've tried to adopt the standards normally give it to one person to do everything. Get a working party together at your entity and, and get them all to do something. Um, and also get some help. And that doesn't need to be um, an IFRS advisory help. You might need people who are actuaries or people who have access to specific data in the industry. Don't try and do it alone. But the very first thing I can say to you is start early. That is the most efficient way to adopt the new standard. The questions are coming fast and furious. Um, how would the last example work on the side of subsidiary B? On subsidiary B side, it's a financial liability. Most likely, it would be carried at amortized cost because there, it, there, there isn't a symmetrical treatment under the new standard for the assets and liabilities. The liabilities are at amortized cost. You'd apply an effective interest rate method, um, which I guess is the same as, as, as in the holding company, but it doesn't have impairment against it. So um, in, in, in the example I've been doing now, it was the impairment against the financial asset. As a financial liability, there's no impairment against the financial liability from the subsidiary side. Um, yeah, I think that's the easy answer to that one. All right, um, I, I raced through that. I knew there was a lot to cover. Um, hopefully that is enough to make your head hurt just for the rest of the afternoon. Um, but I hope you have gotten something out of that, enjoyed it. Um, a little bit over time this time. If you missed something, I think the best way to do it is to head to the guide. The reason why I chose it, as I said, was because all the information I spoke about today is actually in the guide and it's a good reference um, resource available free for download on our website. And hopefully that can help you through at least understanding what's expected in the standard. Probably won't help you too much gathering the information, but at least will help you in understanding what's expected of the new standard um, in relation to related party type relationships. Thank you for your time. Hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll see you next month for leases. Goodbye.